You don't have to be a left-wing liberal to have the mindset that huge amounts of money are being spent on the military uh, that would be better used uh, to help people who are in need. Uh, Ron Paul, who ran for president, uh, basically uh, said the same thing. He, he, he wondered whether it was necessary for us to spend billions of dollars to maintain 160 military bases, major military bases, around the world. Uh, I think if you put all the military units together, it run something like 1,500. Do we really need to spend our money that way? We've been spending a lot of money on the military, and I think that this is where Martin Luther King would have raised huge questions right now. I mean, take the war in Iraq. Most Americans now, I saw the latest study, 60% of Americans think that invading Iraq was a major mistake. What did we accomplish? Can you name one thing that we accomplished? First of all, we weren't even sure why we were going in there. Uh, we, uh, we said at first it was to get rid of weapons of mass destruction. Well, that wasn't true. There weren't weapons of mass destruction. Furthermore, if you're really interested in invading a country to get rid of weapons of mass destruction, Iraq would not be the country to invade. It would be North Korea right now. Come on now. We know that they have weapons of mass destruction. They brag about it. What's more is they have rockets that can deliver those weapons of mass destruction, even to U.S. shores. I mean, that was a phony explanation as to why we went in there. But even if you accept that as valid, when we got in there, we didn't find those weapons. Secondly, we began to say it was to establish democracy. I think that this is, of course, where Martin Luther King would have raised the question. He would have asked the question, is democracy simply a society where the majority votes and the majority rules? Or is a democracy a place where it is safe to be in the minority? That's an important distinction, safe to be in the minority. By the time the war in Iraq was over, we decided that we would call for a free election. And there was a free election. And the Shiites won. And all of a sudden, they established an Islamic Republic that now is persecuting Christians. Uh, churches are being burned down in Baghdad. Uh, they're fleeing the country in large numbers. Uh, there were 1,400,000 Christians in Iraq when we invaded. Now it's down to 450,000. Um, more than a million Christians have fled the country. This is democracy. For this, 4,000 Americans lost their lives. But let's talk about the cost. The cost of that war was $250,000 a minute. Let me repeat that. $250,000 a minute. I don't think Martin Luther King would approve of that. I think he would say that kind of money could be used to alleviate the sufferings of poor people. He probably would have taken seriously the words of the Apostle Paul. They're your enemy. If your enemy hungers, feed him. If he's naked, clothe him. If he's sick, you take care of him. This is the way you deal with your enemy. I know that there are those who are going to say this is unrealistic. Fine, call it unrealistic, but simultaneously call the Bible unrealistic. If you really believe the Bible, then let's do what the Bible says. And if you don't want to do what the Bible says, then don't call yourself an evangelical Christian. Call yourself something else. But we have to ask, why are the Muslims winning in the Middle East? Let's take Hamas as a good example. They have taken over Lebanon. Lebanon was about 50-50 Christian Islam. Today, the Muslims control the country. And Hamas has done it by doing what? War? Killing? No. They have come in and they have provided massive social services, medical care, education. They've set up schools all over the place. 
Uh, they have alleviated a lot of the sufferings of poor people, and they have won the hearts and minds of the uh, Lebanese people. Uh, I knew the general that led the British troops into Iraq when the coalition of armies led by the United States invaded Iraq. He said in my presence, when will you Americans learn that your security is more dependent on the friends that you make than on the armies you deploy? Martin Luther King would have loved that statement. He would have said, let's make friends with our enemies. Let's, I, let's overcome evil with good. And you know who originally said that. Uh, he, he would have said, uh, love your enemies. Do good to those who would hurt you. And you're once again going to say, unrealistic, 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 fine. Then let's call ourselves pragmatic philosophers and not followers of Jesus Christ. Pragmatically, they're right. Biblically, they're wrong. However, Americans get the idea that we're gonna solve the problem of terrorism by killing terrorists. So we have drones. I mean, Barack Obama is uh, killing terrorists with drones. Let me just say this, it's so obvious. You don't get rid of terrorism by killing terrorists any more than you get rid of malaria by killing mosquitoes. You get rid of malaria by getting rid of the swamps that breed the mosquitoes. That would have been Martin Luther King Jr.'s philosophy. He would have said, what breeds terrorism? Is it not poverty? Is it not oppression? Is it not American militarism uh, trying to keep them in check all the time? I mean, I don't know what they teach in history these days, but the history classes I went to really never talk much about what happened to the Arab countries in the Middle East following World War I. How all of this land was turned over to the British and that every one of the countries in the Middle East, Kuwait, uh, you, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, I mean, Libya, you go through all of those countries. They were all created by the British. The British drew the lines, took the land that Arab peoples uh, who lived as nomadic uh, tribes persons and said, we're going to create nations. And we created the nations. The West did. So it's not just the United States, it's the West. I don't know who's going to argue with the fact that we imposed on the Middle East, our will. And we all know what that was about, don't we? I mean, there's nobody going to question this. It was about oil. It was all about oil. And we wanted that oil. And so we, we exercised uh, militaristic control over the Middle East. And we, we humiliated a people. We took away their right of self-determination. And the day came when they had the ability to strike back, and they are striking back, and they continue to strike back. I think what Martin Luther King would advocate is what Bishop Tutu advocated in South Africa. The things are not going to be right until there's repentance. There needs to be repentance. And I know that people who are watching this are going to say, repent. We have nothing to be sorry for. The only people who say that are people who have not read much history about what has happened to the Middle East since World War I up until World War II. Now, they began to see that the oil that we were there to get could be used as a weapon against us. Most of the terrorism that goes on in the Middle East is financed by dollars coming from oil. It's about time we face up to certain realities. That righteousness, justice, must begin in the household of faith. I believe it is the task of the church to call the nation to repentance. I am a pro-life person. I think we need to call the church to repentance over abortion. 
But I think we also need to call the church to repentance upon what we've done to nations, what we've done to the Native American Indians and the Native American nations. I think we need to repent in a much higher scale. It, it's only been the last few years that the Southern Baptist Convention got around to saying, you know, we're really sorry for slavery. Uh, we're really repentant for having supported slavery. Whoa, I mean, do we have to wait a hundred years? Uh, you talk about the church taking the lead? That's not leading, waiting a hundred years to say that slavery was evil and that we were complicit and that we supported it. I mean, it's about time that the church does some real repenting on social issues. If there's anything that Martin Luther King was endeavoring to do, it was to drive America in general and the church in specific to repent, to repent about its complicity in evil. And we've been complicit in a lot of evil. That's what his life was about. It was a call for, for repentance and righteousness in the nation. You can't read through the Old Testament without realizing that that was the constant call of the prophet, that the nation needed to repent. The nation needed to repent. I think this nation is not any different. We somehow have the idea that America is almost sinless. And uh, when we make mistakes, we don't stand up and admit them. Iraq was a mistake. Tell me one good thing that has come out of the war in Iraq. We are now going through an economic recession because we spent ourselves crazy. And I get upset with all of those people who say, well, we, we, we're, in, we're in trouble economically because of all of these entitlement programs. No, we're in trouble because we have spent un, obscene amounts of money on militaristic adventurism. I love it when they pick on old people. I'm old. I go to weddings and the bride's grandmother looks better to me than the bride. I'm not old. And they say, you know, you, you, we can't afford Social Security. What do you mean you can't afford Social Security? This is what I have to say to those people in Congress. We elderly people, all of our lives, paid into Social Security year after year after year. Hundreds of thousands of dollars, each of us did that. And what happened to that money? The US Congress took the money that we paid in Social Security and used it to spend on their own projects. And I would have to say, at least 40, maybe 50% of all the money we paid into Social Security ended up being used for military adventurism. And then they come back and say, we're giving you too much money. I've got news. If the money we had put into Social Security had been properly invested, we would have huge surpluses of money to take care of the elderly in this country. That we're the only nation in the world, the only industrialized nation of the world, of the 17 or 18 industrialized nations, we're the only country that doesn't have universal health care. We spend more money per capita on health care than any other country in the world. More money per capita and yet we have the highest infant mortality rate of the industrialized nations. Our life expectancy is not as long as many of the nations in that list of industrial societies. Uh, we have 44 million Americans who have no health coverage whatsoever. And when, in fact, there's an effort made to provide health care for these 44 million, it's the evangelical community that stands up and says, no way. What do you think Martin Luther King would say about that? What do you think Martin Luther King Jr. would have to say about the fact that this rich nation that is spending so much money on health care neglects 44 million Americans, 13 million of them being children under the age of 12? Woe unto you, said Jesus, who offend one of these little ones. Better for you that a millstone was hung around your neck and that you were dropped into the deepest sea. That's what he said. 
and we as a nation are neglecting poor children, what do you think Martin Luther King Jr. would have to say? It's always interesting that, there, that we've made Martin Luther King into this, this superhero, but we are not willing to stand up for the things that we knew, know he would stand up for. What do you think Martin Luther King Jr. would say about health care in America today? Fair question to ask.